Today let's look at a blog article I found called The Rational Road to Becoming a Christian. It's a, uh, how do I put this, unique 18 point argument that presumably should make us Christians by the end of it. Spoiler, if you're not a Christian yet, it probably won't. Even if you're familiar with Christian apologetics, I'm gonna bet that you're not familiar with this argument. But before we jump into the argument, let's learn a little bit about this blog. Christianity is true. Quite to the contrary of the common contemporary conception. Ah, I assess your affectation of adolescent alliteration as an abortion of art and an appalling abomination. Becoming a Christian does not require that one abandon reason and science. On the contrary, reason and science, along with logic, morality, and everything else that exists, including you and me, only exist because the God described in the Bible existed first. Hey now, save some of that special logic for the actual article, will ya? Now how can I put this simply? Okay. For the sake of argument, sure, let's say that reason and science only exist because of God. I guess we can say concepts exist, in some sense. Now, is it possible in concept that the Christian God could have created a universe containing reason and science, but within which the only way that a human can believe in him and his religion is to abandon reason and science? I don't know, say it's a test of faith or something. You know, to be a true Christian, you have to accept God's word, even if it's contradicted by reason and science. And the answer is yes, it's possible, to the degree that there's no logical contradiction in it. But your argument is, God made reason and science, therefore being a Christian does not require one to abandon reason and science. For that argument to make sense, it would need to be logically impossible for God to create a universe that contains reason and science, but where you have to abandon reason and science to be a Christian. And because that's not the case, your argument makes no sense. The other major misunderstanding about Christianity is that Christians believe that we obey God so that we will be saved. Rather, Christians obey God because we have already been saved by virtue of what God did in sending his eternal son into the world to give his life for those who would believe in him. Okay, well, fine. Thank you so much for deciding not to torture me. Let me grovel and serve you in payment for that basic decency. Yeah, it's dumb, but at least it's not a total logical failure like the last part. And the entire article. And speaking of the article... The rational road to becoming a Christian. Point number one. If I am just the result of mindless forces operating on matter energy in space-time, then I have no real explanation for why I exist as a person with a mind. Maybe you don't. But I don't think what you're trying to say is that you personally are ignorant. I think what you're trying to say is that there can be no real explanation. Or at the very least, that it's impossible for humans to come up with one. But probably that there can't be one at all. So in other words, if you, blog author, can't imagine how something could work, then it's impossible that it could work. A complex process can never emerge from simpler parts and rules because... Why? There's no obvious reason. You're debunking it by using your computer and writing on a blog. And yet, for some reason, you thought it was so self-evident that it could serve as an axiomatic first premise. You know, the rock-solid foundation for an 18-point-long argument. Look, I know that the argument from incredulity seems really compelling to you, and you're probably gonna act all incredulous that anyone could possibly disagree with a claim that's based solely on that logical fallacy. But, too bad. Your incredulity doesn't make a shrug an uh into a compelling argument. And considering that this is your first premise, the premise on which your entire argument relies, well, I could just dismiss the whole argument right now because once you remove the foundation, the whole building falls over. But I'm dying to see where you go from here, so we're gonna keep going. Two, but I clearly exist as a person with a mind capable of observing and understanding the material world around me, including my own physical body, which includes my brain, as well as knowing other people who have bodies and minds. Is that so? Are you sure? I mean, I know your senses tell you all that, but how far can you trust your senses? Nah, I'm just messing with you. Well, sort of. I mean, anyone who's watched my videos knows that I'm a pretty pragmatic person. I'll acknowledge that, philosophically speaking, there is no way to be absolutely sure that your senses are trustworthy, but there's no way to escape from them, so all we can do in our day-to-day -day lives is act like they're generally trustworthy and try to correct for any of the, you know, illusions and misperceptions. But the fact remains that you can't be absolutely certain, which means that this assertion, no matter how clearly true you might think it is, still includes an implicit question mark. 
Now, there's nothing really wrong with that. You can include assumptions in your argument as long as you're willing to accept that that means that your conclusion won't be airtight. You know, you have to recognize that if this is your path to Christianity, it means Christianity is not absolutely certain. It's just something that maybe you might be able to convince people to tentatively accept as true if they're willing to accept your assumptions. But somehow I really don't think that tentative agreement is your goal here. And I don't even think you realize that this is just an assumption rather than an unquestionable fact because it kind of seemed like you were presenting it as the latter rather than the former. It's not too bad so far, but if your argument contains enough of these questionable assertions as critical premises, then instead of winding up with a conclusion sitting on the summit of a mountain of rock-solid reasoning, you're going to wind up with a conclusion teetering on top of a heap of question marks, just waiting for a light breeze to knock it over. But we're only at premise two, go on. Three, therefore the first part of point number one can't be true. Okay, this is already a tangled mess. I mean, what the text literally states, which in an argument like this is all that actually matters, is I personally don't have an explanation for how my mind could be the product of mindless forces, and therefore it can't be. Now, I was generous. I reinterpreted this in your favor because, well, <laughs> you clearly need a little help. And I can see that I'm going to need to keep holding your hand through this whole process, so let me help you out again and just restate your argument so far in a way that isn't a goofy, twisted mess. Premise 1. I have a mind. Premise 2. Minds cannot be the result of mindless forces. Conclusion, therefore my mind is not the result of mindless forces. There. It's a lot prettier, isn't it? You really could have just said that and ended up with basically the same thing at the end. Of course, premise 2 still isn't even slightly supported, but I'm not a miracle worker. 4. Then how can it be that I exist as a person with a mind that can do what point number 2 describes? <laughs> you tell me, you're the one making the argument here. Why are you asking me questions in the middle of your argument? A question is not a premise. 5. If there is a reasonable explanation for how this came to be, then I should accept that it's true. Oh? So what if there are two reasonable explanations? Should you accept them both? Or what if there's only one reasonable explanation right now, but it's wrong? Or what if there's only one explanation that sounds reasonable to you, but there's a bunch of other ones that don't sound reasonable to you, and one of those is actually correct? Like, are those even options in your world, or is it just, uh, yep, yeah, well, that one sounds reasonable, so that's gotta be the right one. Case closed, I'm not thinking about this anymore. I'm a Christian, God's absolutely real, Jesus absolutely died for my sins. No more need to think about that ever again. I don't know, that way of making decisions seems to raise more questions than it answers. Meaning that the heap of question marks you're going to stick your conclusion on top of just got a little bit higher. And trust me, conclusions really do not balance well on piles of question marks. Hopefully with your next point you'll at least pour some concrete on top of those question marks to hold them together, but I'm not going to get my hopes up. 6. Christianity says that both I as a person with a mind and the universe around me were created by and are continually sustained by an almighty personal God. It also says that this god seeks to have a relationship with me. And this is underlined, so this is important. I also have an innate sense that these things are true. But I have been discouraged from considering that these ideas could be true until now. So, I feel like Christianity is true and someone told me I shouldn't. So, the premise is, I feel like Christianity is true and that's relevant somehow. And someone told me I shouldn't think about it and that's also relevant somehow to whether Christianity is true, or at least to whether I believe Christianity is actually true. Well, uh, that's nice for you. But unless somewhere in the rest of this argument you're gonna somehow demonstrate that everything you feel is true is actually true, I'm not sure why you bothered to bring it up. I mean, I feel that Christianity isn't true. We can try to slap fight each other all day long with our feels if you want. My feels are more valid, so I'm right. No, my feels are more valid, so I'm right. <laughs> that might be kind of fun for a change, actually. And when we get bored of that, we can start in with, I've been discouraged more often than you have, so I'm right. I'm sure that'll be a nice cathartic bit of venting for us both, but I don't think it's going to accomplish much. 7. Why shouldn't I consider that this is true? Oh, you're asking me? I don't know, I can't think of a reason why you shouldn't consider whether it's true. I mean, I doubt you live with a mind reader who's threatening to shoot you in the head if you consider it, so... Go nuts. 
If you do live under those conditions, you might want to consider avoiding it. And hell, depending on your goals, which to be fair you haven't stated, but if your goals include being as correct as possible as often as possible, it is going to be useful if you're open-minded when claims are made to you, and then you carefully consider the arguments for and against those claims, because that'll help you avoid false negatives and false positives. But as far as considering that it's true, you probably shouldn't just consider that it's actually true without putting in that hard work first to decide whether it's true. Especially if the alternative is relying on your feels to decide the facts. That's a horribly unreliable path to the truth in every other arena of life, so it probably is in this one too, don't you think? 8. Having been told by others that I shouldn't consider this, or not wanting to consider it because I may not like the consequences if it's true, are not valid reasons for not considering it. Hey, hey for once I mostly agree. I mean, it has nothing to do with the argument about whether Christianity is true, but hell yeah, man, consider away. Consider whatever you want. It's your mind. Don't let your fears or your peers keep you from using it. Although, if your use of it leads you to conclude that the Muslim god is real, and he's gonna roast you for even considering Christianity, at that point, maybe you'll want to dial it back with a considering. You know, to save your own infinitely regenerating skin. Doing the first means I have given up my freedom to decide for myself. Doing the second makes no sense because if it's true that God is real and that he made me, then there are consequences of this whether I like it or not. Okay, great. You personally feel that there's no good reason to avoid questioning something for those particular reasons. So do I. You didn't exactly put forth a case as to why the reasons must be invalid, so it's just another question mark on the heap. But whatever, at least I can't say it's blatantly stupid. But what was the point of this little tangent? Didn't we start out this argument considering the truth of Christianity? Like, I'm reading it, you're writing it, I think we're all on the same page that Christianity can be considered. And yet all of a sudden you feel this need to defend the concept of just considering Christianity. Right in the middle of an argument considering Christianity. Okay. 9. So I ought to consider that this is true. I think you mean if this is true, or at least I hope that's what you mean. But nothing you said here implies that you ought to consider it. I mean, you didn't even try to make an argument for why you should consider it, you just asserted that two very specific reasons to not consider it are not valid. And you could spend a thousand years shooting down reasons why you should not do something, and you would never get to therefore I should. The best you could hope for is to get to, I can't think of any good reason not to, so if I decide to do it someday, it might not be unacceptable. But that doesn't mean you have some duty to do it. 10. If Almighty God exists, and if he made me and continually sustains my life and seeks to have a relationship with me, then I should want to have a relationship with him. Should you? Why? Why do you think you have a duty to want something? I mean, what if he turns out to be a creepy weirdo? An almighty guy has the power to be a creepy weirdo, right? Like, what if the only reason he made you was basically as his personal form of porn? After all, it's gotta get pretty lonely, floating out there all on your own in the timeless, spaceless void. No girl gods for millions and millions of timeless, spaceless voids all around. God really should try to get out more, but hey, at least he's got universe porn. Just type that address into the browser, I think it's letthereBeLight.com, and BAM! Billions of humans doing all the nasty stuff. Pre-recorded, of course, but the humans don't know that. And it's so much hotter when they think it's live. And so God watches you and he goes, eh, I wish I was in a relationship with that one. He's so cute. But for now, I'm just going to watch him take a dump. <laughs> I mean, I guess you can have a relationship with that guy if you really want to, but... Can is a far cry from should. Hell, there might even be some really good reasons not to. Like, what if he's got all kinds of weird kinks, like pretending his boyfriend is his son, or possessing his boyfriend and making him annoy the authorities until they nail him to a cross? 11. If Almighty God could create me and the entire universe, he could certainly reveal himself to the world in a written form. Yeah, he could. It'd be stupidly inefficient and error-prone compared to the millions of other ways he could do it. But nobody said God has to be smart just because he's powerful. 12. If the Christian Bible is the only book in which God does this, then it is the most important book of all. Well, importance is subjective, but sure. If I really thought the Bible was from God, I guess it'd be at least in my top 10. 13. Is the Christian Bible the only book that does this? 
Again, dude, you tell me. It's your argument. Why are you using questions as premises? If you were just writing a casual article and you needed to segue between your different arguments, that would be acceptable, but this is a structured, logical argument. You don't need segues, just present the next premise. Here's a tip, the next time you want to create an argument, just hit Control F and type in a question mark, and if it returns more than zero, you're doing something wrong. Just delete every single line that has a question mark in it and your argument will instantly sound slightly less dumb. 14. The Christian Bible frequently presents God as revealing himself, unlike other supposed holy books which don't claim this. Oh. Oh god. So... <laughs> so when you said if the Christian Bible is the only book in which God reveals himself to the world in a written form, you didn't mean if God wrote a book to reveal his existence to us. You meant literally what it says, which is that if there's only one book where there's a character called God in it who reveals himself to other characters in the story. Any story is from God as long as it's the only story where God shows up and talks to people. <laughs> How do you... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that is so much more dumb. Okay, so, so here's a story I just wrote into my holy notebook. I wrote this story in my holy notebook. Straight from God's ass to my mouth. <laughs> god walked into my house last night and he was like, Sup buddy, I'm God. Don't forget to buy Fruit Loops, all right? I, I'm God, just, just letting you know I'm God. Just reminding you. Just going around reminding people about Fruit Loops, too. Gotta let you know the fruit has two O's in it. It's not the Mandela effect. It didn't used to have UI in a different universe. Kids are just dumb. Okay, bye. I'm God. There, now there are at least two holy books where God shows up and talks to people. And therefore, the Bible is not the only holy book that does this, and therefore, by your logic, it isn't from God. Or at the very least, there's no good reason to think it is. So, congratulations on not being a Christian anymore, I guess? Oh, but what's that I hear? You don't think my holy book is legitimate because I just wrote it right now? Well, fair enough. Let's have a look at something even older than at least the New Testament of the Bible instead. Here's a few selections from chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita, which in case you don't know, because it seems that you haven't read many holy books, is from Hinduism. <coughs> this is Arjuna speaking, by the way. Just as you have described your infinite glory, O Lord, now I long to see it. I want to see you as the supreme ruler of creation. O Lord, master of yoga, if you think me strong enough to behold it, show me your immortal self. And Krishna replies, Behold, Arjuna, a million divine forms with an infinite variety of color and shape. Behold the gods of the natural world and many more wonders never revealed before. Behold the entire cosmos turning within my body and the other things you desire to see. But these things cannot be seen with your physical eyes. Therefore, I give you spiritual vision to perceive my majestic power. And the narrator says, Having spoken these words, Krishna, the master of yoga, revealed to Arjuna his most exalted lordly form. He appeared with an infinite number of faces ornamented by heavenly jewels, displaying unending miracles and the countless weapons of his power. Clothed in celestial garments and covered with garlands, sweet-smelling with heavenly fragrances, he showed himself as the infinite Lord, the source of all wonders, whose face is everywhere. If a thousand suns were to rise in the heavens at the same time, the blaze of their light would resemble the splendor of that supreme spirit. There, within the body of the god of gods, Arjuna saw all the manifold forms of the universe united as one. Filled with amazement, his hair standing on end in ecstasy, he bowed before the Lord with joined palms and spoke these words. O Lord, I see within your body all the gods and every kind of living creature. I see Brahma, the creator, seated on a lotus. I see the ancient sages and the celestial serpents. I see infinite mouths and arms, stomachs and eyes, and you are embodied in every form. I see you everywhere, without beginning, middle, or end. You are the lord of all creation, and the cosmos is in your body. Dot dot dot. You are the supreme, changeless reality, the one thing to be known. You are the refuge of all creation, the immortal spirit, the eternal guardian of eternal dharma. You are without beginning, middle, or end. You touch everything with your infinite power. The sun and the moon are your eyes, and your mouth is fire. Your radiance warms the cosmos. Dot dot dot. 
O oh, mighty lord, at the sight of your myriad eyes and mouths, arms and legs, stomachs and fearful teeth, I and the entire universe shake in terror. O oh, Vishnu, I can see your eyes shining. With open mouth you glitter in an array of colors and your body touches the sky. I look at you and my heart trembles. I have lost all courage and all peace of mind. When I see your mouths with their fearful teeth, mouths burning like the fires at the end of time, I forget where I am and I have no place to go. O oh, Lord, you are the support of the universe. Have mercy on me. Dot, dot, dot. You lap the worlds into your burning mouths and swallow them. Filled with your terrible radiance, O Vishnu, the whole of creation bursts into flames. Tell me who you are, O Lord of terrible form. I bow before you. Have mercy. I want to know who you are, you who existed before all creation. Your nature and workings confound me. Now that is way more awesome than when Jacob mud wrestled with maybe possibly God, but I'm not going to tell you for sure nye, 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 in Genesis 32. As a matter of fact, this whole book is a refutation of this dumb argument of yours, since the whole thing is about a human chit-chatting with God in a field. So, Mr. Blogger Dude, you want to tell me again that the Bible is the only holy book that claims God revealed himself? 15. The Christian Bible says that God is both the almighty king of kings and that he wants to have a personal relationship with us. Unlike Islam's Quran, which only claims the first is true. Actually, the Bible doesn't say that. If you can point me to a place where the Bible states something about a personal relationship with God, I'll eat my words, but the fact is you can't. It's not there. This personal relationship stuff is something that some Christians like to say based on their own interpretation of the Bible, and, you know, the extra stuff they tacked on. But the Bible doesn't say it, it's just a thing some Christians say. So it's kind of weird that you think the Bible does say it. I get the impression that you haven't actually read it, at least not very closely. By the way, what is a personal relationship anyway? To me, it's when you talk to each other, like not one-way prayers, but you actually talk to each other. You do activities together. Well, those aren't things you can do with God in Christianity. At least, not in any sense that's unique. Not in any sense that you can't also do them in Islam or Hinduism or whatever. But I think the real question here is, how does this have any bearing at all on whether Christianity is actually true? You know, it sounds like all you've done is listen to what some random people have had to say about specific holy books, and then you've gone, well, that guy told me this book says God wants a personal relationship with me, and I like relationships, so I'ma pick that one. And we're right back to feels over facts. 16. This agrees with my innate ideas of who God is, from point number six. Right, exactly. Feels over facts. You feel like that's how it is, so that's how it is. Doesn't matter that all kinds of people feel all kinds of different things. Your feelings decide what's true. Well, alright, I'll play your game. I feel like it's not how it is, so it's not. Cue us shouting past each other until the end of time, because we're both acting like idiots. 17. So it is reasonable to believe that the Bible is God's self-revelation or word, and that I should base my life on what it says. Uh, no. I feel good about it, therefore it's true. It's about as far from reasonable as you can possibly get. You remember the title of your article? The Rational Road to Becoming a Christian? Well, I think you took the wrong exit. Look at the sign, you're on Feeling Street. 18. The gospel or good news of the Bible, which was foreshadowed in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament, is that God, our eternal Father, sent his eternal Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to save us from our sins, and then he sent his eternal Holy Spirit to... Great. That's not even a conclusion to your argument. As a matter of fact, you would have been a lot better off stopping at point 17, since at least that was a therefore kind of sentence. I mean, it doesn't help you very much either way. You didn't even manage to get to the point where you could try balancing your conclusion on top of your heap of question marks and watch it fall off. Even that level of failure would have required too much competence for you. But it would have been better. I mean, at least then your argument would have ended with a punchy conclusion instead of a D-minus book report. Bottom line, that all of this is true won't make anyone consider and accept it. Each of us must be willing to do so. Mmm, no. I'm happy to consider it, which is why I've been doing that this whole time. But accept it? You must be joking. But everyone should be and is, therefore culpable before God for refusing to do so. Wow, hey, at least you ended with a deep one. So, the argument runs like this. If Jesus and God and all that is true, everyone should be culpable for refusing to consider and accept that. Why? Once again, we're all supposed to just assume that, for some reason, because apparently you find this claim so self-evidently true that you haven't bothered to spend even just one moment defending it. Personally, I don't see why anyone should be culpable to anyone just for not considering any claim in particular. I mean, unless you're like a cop and someone runs in to report a murder and you just go, meh. 
People have better things to do than carefully evaluate every single claim that's ever presented to them in their entire life. As a matter of fact, that's usually impossible to do in a single lifetime. And as for accepting it, well, maybe they just don't think the reasoning is good enough. Maybe that's their honest position, which, well, let's be exceedingly diplomatic and say that's forgivable if what you just presented is the reasoning they're expected to agree with. Maybe God, or I should say his believers, should present some more compelling reasons instead of just insisting that the unbelievers are going to be culpable for their unbelief. Like as if they're criminals for not accepting the lame reasoning of every religious nut job who comes knocking at their door at 8 in the morning. You wouldn't feel any need to accept arguments this bad from a Mormon who showed up at your house. Why should I feel like I have to accept them from you? <sighs> well that was an absolute train wreck, but I gotta give you some credit. It was an argument I haven't heard before, which doesn't happen too often these days, so bravo! Ah, uh, Christopher Andrus. You've got a unique brand of stupidity. That's great. Thanks for not feeling embarrassed about sharing it with the world. <sighs> Alright, well, if you like this video, little change up here. Sure, subscribe, but I have an email list now. So no matter what happens with any video platform, if YouTube decides not to notify you, if any website decides to ban me or whatever, if you think you're being auto-unsubscribed, that email list is a dependable way for me to get notifications about new videos to all of you. So all you have to do is go to list.logic.com. Type your email address in the box, click submit. That's it. And after that you're going to start getting emails about new videos. And that makes us completely platform independent, no more need to rely on YouTube, no more need to rely on the management of any other video site, good old fashioned email, you all have it, I have it, let's use it. Starting in September people who are on that email list are going to get my videos one day early. That means if you want to see it first you have to be on that list. And if you really like my channel, you can support me on Patreon. Here are the $5 patrons. Now, starting in September, because these people already get videos one day early, these are going to start to get videos two days early. And everyone who's supporting me on Patreon or PayPal is just great. They're awesome. And that is it. I will see you on the next video.